Today I have with me Mr. Mark McVeigh from KBE Plus, and he is a gear technology expert, and today we're, I'm thankful for him to be with us, and he'll be speaking about gears and the transition to uh, e-vehicles from internal combustion engines. So uh, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, it's hard to believe that it's been, oh, geez, six months since we uh, first got to meet. Uh, Mark and I uh, had the pleasure of being together in an AGMA uh, training course, and uh, it was such a wonderful time. I was glad to ask him to come back and join us, and uh, we'll be talking in lengthy extents about uh, e-vehicles and the transmission components associated with that. So uh, with that, uh, it's exciting to be here, and, uh, and thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. I do appreciate the, the opportunity. It was a great session. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed meeting you and all the rest of the folks, and, and uh, the opportunity to come do this. This is uh, way outside of my norm, so it's a new and interesting experience, but not the technology, of course. So thanks for having me. All right, Mark, as you're well aware, we're here to talk about the transition from the uh, internal combustion engine to EV uh, vehicles. And, um, you know, as I understand, there's a pretty significant difference in the powertrains between uh, one versus the other. Uh, maybe you could, maybe we'll start out by talking about some of those transitional changes and then sure. what's involved with those. Sure, sure. Yeah, and, and, and perhaps the best way is to just describe the, the current, if you will, or the, the past 100-year powertrain. And if we think about it, manual transmissions, you know, we've all driven them perhaps, but they shift between gears. We have to make all those choices. They have multiple speeds, five, six, 10 speed transmissions. And every gear has its own, or every speed ratio, excuse me, has its own gear, bearing, clutch, we call them synchronizers. And we're responsible as the driver to decide when to shift, how to shift, and to make it, make it smooth, if you will, for, mm -hmm. for, the, for the occupants, for the rest of the car. We've gone to manual transmissions. They're clearly the majority of transmissions now. M again, multiple speed. Instead of the, the operator making the shift, the car now decides on its own. It's much safer. It deals with perhaps less than skilled drivers in terms of a manual transmission. But it has multiple speeds, multiple speed ratios, we tend to call them. And they're all driven by now gears, of course, but clutches. And the clutches have have a whole host of associated issues, if you will, parasitic losses. But we're trying to get the engine, the internal combustion engine, to run at its sweet spot, meaning max power when you're trying to accelerate, min fuel consumption when you're trying to cruise on down the road. And the more speeds we have, the easier that becomes. Automatic transmissions allow the designer to make the shift points to do the best job optimizing that, but manual transmissions are the most efficient. So then we came up with DCTs, dual clutch transmissions, where in fact we can have automatic transmission like response control by the computer on the car to make it safe, but yet smooth operation like an automatic transmission, and then we gain back the efficiency. But we still have multiple speed ratios. If we think about an EV, we have a machine, the electric machine or the electric motor, that can go from zero to full rotational speed and make full power in that entire range or give us full torque in that entire range, which you can't do with an internal combustion engine. So we now have the necessity to move away from multi-speed and into a single speed, but a speed now or a gear train and bearings and all the other associated components that can handle 15, 18,000 RPM, which is typical for an e-machine or an electric motor to get efficient to do things that, that we want in a powertrain. Interesting. Now, uh, I've, from what I understand, um, what's the typical internal combustion engine rotational speed? Maybe your typical commuter car, if you will. Yeah, and we, <clears throat> we have a range here, mm -hmm. five or 6,000 RPM, typical for an internal combustion engine, mm -hmm. the standard product. You've got cars that'll turn faster than that. Uh, we can think to the, the new C8 Corvette, 8,600 RPM. You can think to street motorcycles, 12,000 RPM, uh, those types of things. Those are at the far end of their spectrum, and mm -hmm. generally speaking, we don't operate up there. Electric machines, conversely, the faster you spin them, the more efficient they and the control electronics become. So we want these higher speeds for the e-machine side. The mechanical side, the transaxle, it gets uh, problematic. I see. I would say that um, 
those are some pretty high RPMs, but as you mentioned, it's the sweet spot you're after, and uh, sure. and, and, we, and we have to consider those those rotational speeds now with the, these vehicles. So quite interesting. So very good points. Now, um, you and I have been talking over uh, the past couple of days, and and I think you have a good uh, favorite topic, and maybe that's lubrication. That yes. so seems to be something that's sensitive to this system as well. Lubrication is is a whole nother uh, suite of engineering, if you will. We, we, we have learned a great deal about the lubricant, the oil and the additives that you put into it, and we are doing a better job understanding lubrication, which is the use of the lubricant. But two things that are problematic. One, at very high torque, very low speed, it's hard to develop a full lubricant layer. Uh, the classic term is elasto-hydrodynamic shear layer. Lots of fancy words, <laughs> but it simply means that I need to have a layer of lubricant. And when I'm not turning very fast, it's hard to develop that lubricant. Conversely, at high rotational speeds, it's hard to keep the lubricant on the gears, on the bearings, because the centripetal force throwing it off, it's slinging it out type thing. So as we move from an internal combustion engine, which doesn't make much power below 1,100 RPM, doesn't make much above 6,000, pick your number, to a machine, internal or, um, electric machine, that at zero RPM can make full torque, all the way up to 15 or 18,000 RPM, we need to rethink the strategy of lubrication, not just the lubricant, but how we entrain it on the gears and on the bearings. We can't forget that the maximum or the, the most important usage and the maximum effort we put through the lubricant is actually cooling. And if we can't get the lubricant on the parts, we can't cool them. Can't lubricant them either. But Great. Yeah. Interesting. So, yeah, that's, there's, again, a number of different uh, variables associated with it. So and let's talk away, take a minute to talk about the fact that the surface finish dictates lubricant layer. We mm -hmm. can't forget that as we move towards better gears, better bearings, that we have to leave something behind for the lubricant to grab onto mm -hmm. or chemically bond to. Very important new technology now there you, as now well. Now, you spoke whenever we were in our, our, our training segment about super finishing. Is that something as well that uh, influences the, the, sure. sort of the manufacturing technique, if you will? Yes. Uh, super finishing is, is trying to get rid of the asperities, the high spots, the roughness, if mm -hmm. you will, put it in layman terms. And you can get it too smooth. If you think about putting a lubricant on a piece of glass, you can easily squeegee it away. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly it can't do its job if it's not there. So there's a balance between how smooth bearings want to be smooth, gear surfaces want to be smooth for life, quiet, NBH we talk about, but we also need to entrain the, the lubricant. We have to give the lubricant a layer to grab onto. Mm -hmm. So it's a balancing act, and it becomes finer every day. All of this is extending what we already know to the next level. Well, that's certainly a big difference between the two systems. And um, now, I understand that there's some spikes going on, and uh, you know maybe now we can switch into the transition of these new powertrains. And uh, you know what's the changes in the design requirements, um, the uh, functional requirements, operational requirements, and, and some of those features that are associated with with this transition and these changes to the new uh, the new drivetrains. Sure. Yeah. Let me let me kind of recap like I did with the, the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. And our EV machines, our electric vehicles, we only have one speed, first and foremost. Uh, at least that's the most common at this point mm -hmm. in the industry, which means we don't have to shift between gears, but we do have to have a gear train that can go from zero RPM to pick at 15,000 RPM and adequately live under all of those conditions. An internal combustion engine I mentioned 1,100 to 4,500, 5,000, it makes its max power and, and gets the work done. An e-machine, electric motor, zero RPM to max rotational speed, it can make all the torque that the design can handle. And it can come on in an instant. So now what I need to do is I get rid of the internal clutches, synchronizers in a manual or clutches in an automatic. I get rid of all the multiple speed ratios. I only have one speed ratio. I may have multiple gears. Mm -hmm. I may have 10 to 1 ratio with two gear sets, but they're all engaged all the time. So there's no synchros, no clutches. But now I have to have a gear train that can handle full power, full torque at zero RPM, torque times speed as well as at 15,000 or something of this nature. So I need now to come up with a system that can handle that. Lubrication becomes far more critical. We 
typically move away from splash lubrication and move into forced lubrication, a pump and a nozzle forced lubrication. The job of the lubricant is primarily cooling and lubrication, but cooling, now I'm going to active cooling, radiator, these types of things, and I need to get all of that done while reducing the noise. In the gear industry, we talked about NVH, noise, vibration, and harshness. What we're really talking about in the transaxle is vibration. We need to get the vibration down. I don't have a big internal combustion engine masking the noise. I don't have a big internal combustion engine damping out the vibration. E-machines, the electric motor part, is very susceptible or sensitive to vibrations, either internal or reflected to it from our transmission. And the cars are simply just getting quieter. People expect an electric vehicle to be quieter than an internal combustion engine. Well, I need to get the gears to do that as well. We start now to look at things like much higher quality gears, much higher surface finishes, much more consistent product, both in terms of the gear, but the entire powertrain. All of these things speak to making less vibration, less noise. Now, you made a comment. <coughs> uh, again, I'll keep referring back to the training session and, and some of our other discussions. Sure. And, uh, and actually, it resonated with me, resonated. Very that, cool. that a gear, it really is essentially a tuning fork, right? Maybe, Correct. Maybe touch on that for a moment. Yeah, if you think about a gear, and you know, you tend to use your hands for these types of things, but the gear teeth themselves are just cantilevered beams, and you ref deflect them, and they spring back, those types of things. That's no different than a tuning fork. So a gear in and of itself has a frequency, has a frequency response. But the more critical, and what we need to work on, or what I work on all the time, is not so much the energy it creates under load, but the energy that it causes it to vibrate. And just like a tuning fork, if you think about it, you take it and you tap it or you hit it with a hammer and it hums or you know, whatever frequency mm -hmm. it is, of course, it hums at you. Well, the same thing happens to a gear, completely unloaded. If you excite it externally, it will, of course, have this frequency response. Interestingly enough, the inconsistency in the material and the geometry and the heat treat, every aspect of our production cycle that goes into making a gear causes those phenomenon to occur. What we want is all those phenomena to line up. I certainly don't want one tooth responding differently than the next tooth. Now I have a whole harmonic. It sounds like an orchestra, and we don't, we can't deal with that. Well, I like that you're mentioning materials. Materials are near and dear to my heart, so uh, we'll get into that, I know, more in our discussion, but uh, uh, good to hear that materials is, and material properties are you know, something to consider mm -hmm. as, we, uh, as we do make the transition and consider the design challenges associated with the, the higher RPMs and uh, mechanical needs of these, uh, these components. Sure. Um, you know, in addition, maybe chat about some of those, the material properties, as you said, the uniformity. Um, uh, <coughs> would you say that maybe your traditional ICEs are, are maybe less uniform material or, you know, less, high, less quality of steels or, you know, maybe the, uh, the properties are different that needed for the uh, EV? Good point, Tom. I mean, yes, there's no question that material properties are key to everything we try to do. Consistency is as much consistency within the part, within the material, within the processes, the, all aspects of manufacturing, as it is part to part in a finished product. To say that they're new is, a, is perhaps a bit of a stretch. Every year, our requirements go up. Our mandates for performance of the material, if you'll accept that purity and consistency and all these other measures that we call performance, do in fact increase. And in the EV spaces, if we want to go down that path, consistency is even more paramount. The faster things rotate, the more vibration they create. We don't hear gears. We hear them vibrating door panels in a car or things of this nature. The wider your range, the 0 to 15,000 RPM, the more frequencies you excite, the more noises you make. Let's get back to consistency for a moment. The other side of the discussion is getting the parts to live under these new conditions, these almost stepwise changes in torque, these high rotational speeds, these high temperatures. Materials, crystalline materials, fail on the grain boundaries. We know this. Uniformity of the crystals, more importantly, uniformity of the grain boundaries, mm -hmm. both in terms of thickness and total length around the crystal, is what determines the consistency of performance in the material. And when we talk about things in this nature, 
giving, given that I'll take material and cut it, that induces stresses, and we'll come back to that in terms of heat treat. But the heat treating process also causes us to either improve or reduce, if you will, the performance of a material by changing this relationship. So what we want is we want material properties that are consistent. To get those, we want grain structure that's consistent. And that's the year over year big change that we're looking for, is to drive consistency and drive all of our real world processes, materials, uh, the list goes on, but towards the theoretical. We know what these things are theoretically. It's the practicality of achieving consistency at a reasonable cost. It's not like we can't make almost pure material. We can't afford that, right? There's this issue we have to balance. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're striving for is consistency, uniformity, and coming closer to full theoretical performance criteria. Well, based on the, these differences, um, how do gear designers become or start to think about overcoming these challenges? Um, you know, basically, what would you say to the viewers um, that, that are impacted by the changes in performance demands? You know, what techniques or thoughts will they employ to uh, then start to think about uh, how they then des to design the new transmissions and, and components for that matter? Yeah. And, and I, I alluded to it just a moment ago. There's, there's two sources of, if you will, issue as we try to enhance performance through heat treat. Talked about you know, the, the actual structure of the material mm -hmm. and, and trying to get the intergranulars uniform and everything we chatted a moment ago. The second is, and, and generally speaking, people think more about this uh, or think it's more the, the maximum criteria, but it is the induced stresses. Heat treat reduces reduces or relieves, hopefully completely, the stress is internal to the part. Okay, well, where do these stresses come from? Two sources. We touched on it a moment ago, the raw material properties. We mm -hmm. want better performing, more pure, higher quality raw material that we start to cut our gears or bearing races or whatever part we're cutting. Let's stay with gears. Gears from. Second, when we cut a gear tooth, and remember, we don't cut the tooth, we cut the gash, leave the tooth behind, mm -hmm. but what have you. When we cut the gash, we are doing a shearing operation. Whether it's gear hobbing or gear shaping or broaching or milling, the list goes on. It's unimportant. They're all shearing operations. Mm -hmm. And shear induces shear stress. This is where the term comes from. And it's not uniform. It's at the face of the cutter and the piece you're cutting. It's not into the core of the material. So I've got that non-uniformity. And then when I heat treat it, this uniformity comes out. This is the objective of heat treating is to come to enhance properties, but to come to uniformity. So I take that shear stress back out. Well, if it is not uniform through the part, then it comes out non-uniform. Again, you can start to see how this whole thing melds together, if you will, or from a gear engineer point of view, meshes together. Sorry, throw it in. <laughs> when I cut the part, I not only shear the face of the tooth, but the width of the part, I start at the top, cutter's cool, at the end of cut, cutter's hot. So I get non-uniformities in this regard as well. Let's just take the next, the third of the three that we talk about. The first part I cut, the, sharp, the, the cutter is very, very sharp and, and does a good job. The last piece I cut, the cutter's the reason it's the last piece is the cutter's done. It's dull. It may go off a of resharpening. That kind of resets the clock, if you will. The last piece I cut, the cutter is as dull as I can accept it. The shear stress induced is different. Mm -hmm. So when we take then now the part with these different stresses internal and we heat treat it, we get different responses. All right, so what do we do? Well, after heat treat, we can do post-heat treat machining, grinding, these types of things. And grinding's fine. It is a way to make corrections and to get the right surface finish. We talked about that from lubrication, get the right geometry from noise standpoint. And we can even grind asymmetrically, microgeometry changes, these types of things. But the more we grind, the more of the heat treat effect at the surface we grind away. So we don't want to do that. Grinding, again, fine machining process relative to cutting, it's slow. So the more we feel we have to grind, the slower our process or the more grinders we have to have to keep throughput up. So grinding, even though we can do a great deal with it, it is a costly bag. Interesting. Now, I've spent, I'll be honest, for those machinists in the audience, I've spent a few times, a few days machining myself, and 
I know that changing a tool is no fun as a machinist because it's, you have to stop your machine, change over the tools, uh, and then recalibrate everything. And it's certainly not any fun to do so because, again, your manager is expecting you to push out parts after one after another after another. So you're trying to stretch that tool life as long as you can. Sure. However, you're impacting the, uh, the quality of the material, correct? Right, and add to that the fact that nobody can afford for a machine to be down. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a cutter in the machine and perhaps you have a handle, rough idea of how many parts you can get before it dulls, you've got to have another cutter ready to take its place while that cutter goes out to be resharpened. God forbid you have an accident where you chip a tooth prematurely, you know, invalidating that cutter. You can't wait for the cycle. So our tooling databases, our, the cost of our tools is very, very high because of that. If we can get more uniform properties, we can extend tool life, and we can probably, have, other than the inadvertent accidents, mm. we can have a better handle on the cost of our tooling. Cost, the tooling database tend to cost as much, if not more, than the machine, just to keep production running. You know, so money's money. Okay, so we've talked about some of these de design techniques, and, uh, and we know that there's more rigid uh, applications of these standards. Um, there's best practices and gear design techniques uh, that we've talked about. So maybe you can talk about a little bit more in depth, again, how about the materials and how they're going to hold up in the, in the environments that we're going to subject them to. Sure. Sure. I'm kind of building a little bit on what we said a moment ago. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about the cutting operation. We've talked about the inducing stresses from the cutting and tool life and the, and the cost, those types of things. I want to make sure everybody's clear on the fact that the quality levels we need, the resultant product, right, the standards, AGMA and ISO and DIN and JIT and, and the worldwide standards, I won't list them all, speak to the finished part. How do we get to that finished part is not as well defined. Mm -hmm. It is more up to us as a function of a whole host of things, largely all driven by cost, of course. The less costly way to manufacture a part to meet the print, the better your profitability. So how can we, in fact, do that? Well, we can start the process all over again from the very raw material. The more uniform that is, the better the material, the higher the material properties. We, I am seeing in, over my career that we are using higher quality, thus higher cost, materials in our gear designs. People are willing to, perhaps don't like it, but are willing to pay for bit higher performing raw material because they know that in fact they can get a better product and save time during the production process. We can, we do after cutting or any significant stress-inducing work, you can think forging at this point as well, we will relieve the induced stresses before we go for final machining. And I'm not talking about cutting a gear gash, heat treating it, and then grinding as much as cutting, relieving stress before heat treat, checking the part before heat treat, and ensuring that our amount of distortion anticipated out of heat treat is within our grinding parameters or skiving or honing. There's a whole host of post-heat treat machining techniques we can use. And, in fact, we will see that people are, the industry, the, the people that make these decisions, are, in fact, willing to embrace, if you will, any added step in a process costs money, willing to accept these things to try and get a better finished parts and be better management of costs throughout the process. And, you know, we can look at that even from the point of view of scrap. The last thing you want to do is put all the money into the part and at the last step, scrap it out. I mean, if you're going to scrap a part, let's do it early on and save the cost, that type of thing. So there's all these things that, that continue on. Now, I understand the need for consistency when I do my calculations, when I design a gear, when I analyze a gear for noise, for life, all these various different things, I take these properties into account. And I understand the measure of performance. Where I rely on other people, such as yourself, is how do we do that? How do we get these higher performing properties? Remember, we started with a higher performing material. I've reduced how much I've degraded that material through inducing stresses and such as this. How do I keep that material that I've spent all this time doing good to the end? And that's where all of this comes in. Well, good point there. And if I may, um, you're speaking to my realm of expertise as far as the, the heat treatment is concerned. And there's multiple ways. You know, again, the tr traditional uh, techniques for heat treatment is let's just push as many parts as we can through and get as many yeah. parts out as possible. It's just to reduce costs, because sure. that's what uh, the whole goal is. Um, but we're seeing that with the higher performance transmissions that, you know, uh, 
the manufacturers these days are now considering maybe some different techniques as far as heat treatment is concerned, i.e. Uh, vacuum heat treatment. Again, that's more my specialty. And in vacuum heat treatment, there's a number of different ways that you can process after after the stress relieving. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, these, these components will either need to be hardened, uh, carburized, or nitrided, so on and so forth. And there's a several different ways of doing so. Uh, things that come to mind are uh, vacuum oil quench. If you need a, a very rapid quench and utilize vacuum, you know, vacuum reduces, uh, excuse me, eliminates the oxygen in, in the uh, heat treatment environment, yep. uh, thus giving some improved mechanical properties without the uh, oxidation that takes place. Um, and if you need the fast quench, you can certainly use a vacuum oil quench. Uh, other techniques, which is a little bit more environmentally friendly would be a uh, vacuum furnace with high pressure gas quench. And high pressure gas quench is simply just y your heat treatment process, you heat up, and then after uh, you get to your temperatures, you can either maybe do a carburizing process where you're boosting yeah. carbon, uh, and then subsequently going into a high pressure gas quench. And maybe those of you that aren't familiar with high pressure gas quench, it's more of a softer quench, and thus you can reduce some distortion, uh, maybe giving you a better quality gear so that the, the grinders aren't working so hard to remove maybe more material from one side versus the other. Um, and then if you want to take it a step further, uh, there's a certain technique that we have, a certain process called 4D quench. And, uh, and that's really the creme de la creme, if you will, of, of being able to control distortion in a heat treatment furnace, comparable to press quenching without all of the difficulties of a press yeah, quench. Uh, and the beautiful thing about that system is that you can insert one gear uh, or bearing, uh, whichever component it is that you're looking to harden, uh, and then introduce uh, what we say 4D quench, where we'll create a profile uh, of a manifold around a component and be able to focus specifically some um, some gas nozzle velocity to areas of the component that you want to cool quicker or cool, uh, or cool slower. Uh, and then the 4D quench, you, you, we actually rotate the component. So another level of uh, control for distortion, which I think helps out the downstream production efforts. Uh, absolutely, because, you know, you, and you brought up a an, an very interesting topic I had intended to get to was the, especially in the vacuum furnace, oxidation. We are seeing, uh, clearly, we went to the grain structure discussion, and that's where cracks initiate and the failure mechanisms start. We, we, we know all the fracture mechanic, or mechanics. But if you think about a vehicle, if I buy an electric vehicle, I'm going to expect 100,000 miles. Let's call that our bellwether or our target. Mm -hmm. And if I have an internal combustion engine of a modern product, I expect 100,000 miles. Well, stop and think about the fact that the electric machine is turning much faster. So even though the total distance on a car is 100,000 miles, mm -hmm. the number of cycles on the gear are significantly increased because the rotational speed is increased. So now my cycle fatigue, the number of cycles before the part fatigues and fails, we don't break gear teeth off in cars. It's mm -hmm. considered not a good thing in the industry, but there nothing's an infinite life, so we're going to have surface defects, pitting, that type of thing. What's well, a high cycle fatigue phenomenon? And by going to an electric car, you're increasing the number of cycles significantly, order of magnitude perhaps. So in fact, anything we can do to take materials that we've been using for X many years and extend their ability against these new higher cycle requirements, an order of magnitude is a big change. And if we can in fact use the vacuum technique and the 4D quenching, which gives me the ability to almost prescript my cooling rate and, and the effect of on heat treat and on material performance and properties, uh, this this speaks to to addressing that. That's one of the key things that we as designers have to deal with, is the fact that not only do we have these incre incredible torque potential, potential spikes, we've got to cool it, that's always a big problem, but we now see significantly more cycles. The number of cycles to failure has to, like I said a moment ago, maybe as much as an order of magnitude. And the material, isn't changing that much. Steel is steel to a certain extent. So it's what we do with it to enhance the performance. Not to steal your thunder, mm. but these are the techniques we need, I need as a gear designer to be able to leverage to get my job done or to get my customer's job done. So Mark, we are, as a society are beginning to see the transition to the reduction of carbon emissions. 
Um, maybe you can speak to what else is going to be changed in the powertrain uh, that will address this and, and some of those uh, variable features that, again, are going to be that change uh, that we're going to see uh, with these, these mandates, if you will. Sure, sure. Uh, the mechanism of change is, is very broad, and, and we'll, we'll keep it focused a little bit. But the mandates is, that you refer to have you know, been largely around since the 70s, where we started to deal with fuel economy, and people started to actually think about the number of gallons per mile or miles per gallon, depending on the vehicle you've got that you're using. And now we look at it from the standpoint of how much carbon we put in the environment, and, and although we still call it miles per gallon, we're all becoming much more conversant, if you will, from that point of view, and we want to reduce that. We think of the electric machine as putting no carbon in the environment, and one can make an argument for that, and I, I would agree with that as well. But I want to make clear that the quality, if you will, targets, requirements may be a better word, but for the moment, let's call them targets, have existed. If we look at AGMA or ISO or DIN or, again, any of the aforementioned uh, standard bodies that I talked about, they have had requirements, the definition of what a very high quality gear is. We did not need that until just recently, largely because of the high torque loads, the high rotational speeds, all the reasons we've been talking about here today. We have got the standards. We know how to do that. The driver, there's really two, and I've touched on it twice already, but again, cost, being able to do it cost effectively. We don't want a stepwise change in the cost of our vehicles or anything that has a gear train in it. We also want to make sure that part over part is more consistent than it has been in the past. And you just talked about that a moment ago with the various technologies for heat treating and our abilities to do this. Cost, again, is driven by the material cost going up, but reducing cost along the way in terms of the manufacturing. But to be clear, the standards have existed. We know what we need to do. It's now applying those standards. Okay, so let's open that discussion for a moment. As we move forward in this new arena, and let's focus mostly on electric vehicles, we can talk about hybrids as well. The design criteria, the objectives are changing. We've been speaking to that. In industry, our new engineers learn from our more senior people. There's certainly a great deal of information exchanged during college and those types of things, but a great deal of information is exchanged still to this day on the job training, mentorship, uh, any of those terms. We are now designing two new targets. So even though that's applicable, this experiential information, we need to get our young engineers new to the field, maybe a more senior person just coming into gearing or bearings or what have you, or a new engineer coming into to a workforce. We need to get them up to the speed quicker. So we rely more heavily on the standards. We rely more heavily on our suppliers. You make this technology and you make it in a machine, but you don't use it per se, you sell the machine. Well, we're selling technology. Same thing here. I don't cut gears, I show people how to do that. So we need to push this forward and help people learn quicker, learn in more depth, and learn how to leverage these things. And that's where we all need to do a better job if we understand something, if you will, giving it back to society, teaching people how to use it, how to make better use of it, how it's applicable. Uh, the, the fundamentals of some of the things that we learn about have grown. If you think about the chemistry of lubricants, I was talking about that a moment ago. It, it's not the 10W30 that we used to put in our lawnmowers. Okay, those days are right. gone. All the processes you talked about, you talked about five different if you will, machines, hardware, but their processes underneath. Heat treat used to be a furnace. So we need to help people understand that. I do, you do, all of us do, to make the product go forward. Nobody can know it all anymore. All right, Mark. So tell me, what does that all mean? Well, yeah, uh, there's no question that we're going to continue to make things better. Incremental improvement, the, those types of things. You'd asked about 
requirements of gear design. Yeah, we're going to go to the next level of ISO quality in terms of gear form and reduction in NVH and life improvement, all the things we've talked about. But what I did bring along today was a, a study that we had done wherein if you take a look, you'll see in the face of the gear, there are what, if you think about a violin, they're called F slots. This is what they call them in the violin and acoustic guitar industry. And I looked at that, and I, and, and I had a particular job where I worked with a client, and they had a noise problem, a signature problem. The e-machine was generating frequency that caused the gear train to respond in an unproductive manner. It was wearing out the bearings prematurely. So we, we got the whole envelope here. The e-machine was causing the gear to vibrate and fail the bearings. Right, and the traditional is you call the bearing supplier, and your bearings are failing. What? And they come up with a bigger bearing, not it at all. If you take a look behind us, you'll see that in fact what I did is I used the F slots in a violin, in a guitar. They're used to tune the the device, not tighten the strings, but to give it the tonal quality of the instrument. Well, if I took that thought process and, if you will, inversed it. I could use the ability of these F slots, as they call them, to tune out the certain tonal qualities from the gear train. All right, so this is a cool project, and the graphic behind me is a, a modal analysis, and, and it's one of the mode shapes that was causing the most problem. You can see the gear warping out of plane, which is putting undue stress on the bearings, which was the fault mechanism, or the, excuse me, driver for the fault. That's not the issue for the discussion. The issue for the discussion is to start to think about all the tools we have at our disposal. I, whether or not this is the first time a gear has been cut with an F-slot in it, I don't know. These aren't lightning holes in the traditional sense to reduce, remove material or reduce weight or any of those things. It's actually tuning this gear to respond out of phase with the driver that was causing the problem. So we need to start as a group designer, an analyst, machine tool provider, material provider, how we can take all of these things and meld them together. And no longer do you do your job and here's my result, call me when, you're, when you need the next one. We need to work together. And this is an interesting little example. I love the gear math. I love frequency. So that was fun. That's why I brought it along. But it does show us a mechanism by which we start to build on each other. I need to learn more about what you do. People need to learn more about what I do, and we need to do it together. And that's kind of the core of my message is that there is so much we no longer can know it all ourselves. We need to rely heavily on our suppliers and other, if you will, cells of expertise. So, well, excellent. And and, and uh, I like you rely on the experts within our industry, and Certainly. it's it's always a pleasure to uh, to learn more, to be engaged in, and further uh, share our message with the, our viewers uh, about these transitions, these changes, and uh, how it impacts your uh, your field of experience, and and then subsequently how it's downstream filtered to to my own. Uh, you know, we have a number of customers that are looking to the new heat treatment methods sure. to improve those qualities so that uh, there's not so much effort downstream and perhaps we can even eliminate uh, some of those downstream operations by improving the heat treatment process altogether. Um, I like that uh, it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent within the market and, sure. and those, are star those individuals are starting to look towards heat treatment as not the black box. Uh, or the, the black magic, um, and they're thinking about the recipe and process that's involved in how microstructure is being affected with temperatures, durations, quench methods, distortions, and so on. So Even as simple as what you can achieve using these techniques. Maybe you don't understand the recipe or the metallurgy or, 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 but that you can do these things. Nobody that ever designed a guitar thought about putting it in a gear. <laughs> Nobody that ever made a gear thought about tuning it, mm -hmm. right? So we start to do these combination type effects. And like you say, we leverage other people. We lever leverage other expertise. So uh, it's a cool world. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, Mark, that's all my questions for today. It's been a great uh, event spending time with you. Your expertise you. obviously is, is well validated and we're excited for you to be here and share your expertise with us. So thank you, sir. Thank for you. Your time. Thank I appreciate you for it. inviting me. It's always a pleasure to see you and, and again, sharing your thoughts with our audience and uh, for our audience. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure for you to join us. 
Uh, we're happy for you to be here, and uh, hopefully you take a lot home uh, from our talks today and, and enjoy the uh, rest of our programs that we have in our eSeminar 4.0. And with that, I'll say goodbye and thank you. <laughs>